You know, there is a sort of philosophy behind why we would sing a Garth Brooks song in worship. It's that it seems to me there is no sacred and profane. There is no holy and unholy. Our lives are holy as we make them holy. And so when we can recognize something from the non-sacred part of our lives in sacred time, maybe it makes, reminds us that our whole lives are holy and not just parts of them. Well, you didn't ask for that. That's not what I came here to tell you. <laughs> there was a question that preoccupied our religious ancestors, the Puritans. Which people constitute the church? It was key to their theology. In England, everyone was a member of the state-sanctioned church. But in New England, they decided things would be different. The church must be made up only of the people they called the convinced, those people who believed in the teachings of the church and lived accordingly. In other words, our religious ancestors decided church membership would be voluntary. Not everybody in early America agreed, but where there was a great deal of Mennonite and Baptist and Quaker influences, places like Pennsylvania and Rhode Island and New Jersey, there were no state churches. People could join or not join the church as radical as that was, as they wished. And volunteerism worked. More people attended church in those places where there was no government compulsion for them to be the church. As historian Robert Handy wrote, these examples were even cited abroad. As when the French people in 1789 were urged to imitate the Pennsylvanians in in matters of religion. It turned out not forcing people to come to church led more people to come to church. But this join if you want to, don't join if you don't want to idea caught fire outside the world of religion too. Over time, America became a nation of voluntary associations. In his uh, essay entitled Remarks on Associations, don't you wish you had been there when that was delivered? Unitarian minister William Ellery Channing said, Men have learned what wonders can be accomplished in certain cases by union and seem to think that union is competent to everything. You can scarcely name an object, he wrote, for which some institution has not been formed. Would men spread one set of opinions or crush another? They make a society. Would one class encourage horse racing and another discourage traveling on Sunday? They form societies. And he goes on and on. He was as upset as he seems to have become in public. The New England preacher and labor leader Orestus Brownson said, Matters have come to such a pass that a peaceable man can hardly venture to eat or drink, to go to bed or get up, to correct his children or kiss his wife without obtaining the permission and direction of some society. It seems... A person could choose or not choose to join any one of thousands and thousands of affinity groups. One gets the feeling that poor Brownson and Channing would be vexed sore by Facebook groups and Twitter hashtags. (laughs) The proliferation of voluntary associations changed everything for religion eventually. It's hard to imagine that long ago, a century and more before Channing, The Puritans actually gave prospective members a test. What would you do if we gave you a test to join? You had to (laughs) qualify. What was that? Jane said something. (laughs) That's not fair. A survey is not a test, Jane. (laughs) Although we're looking for yours now. So you had to qualify with the Puritans for church membership. And to qualify, you had to have an experience of regenerating grace. You had to be able to tell when you were saved, as some people put it. You had to espouse the right beliefs, and you had to display upright conduct as defined by the church. But with voluntary society springing up everywhere and with churches 
chief among the voluntary associations, Baptists, Presbyterians, Quakers, Mennonites, on and on, thankfully a test for acceptance into religion gave way to efforts to convince people that your faith was the one to join. Well, today, congregations are often happy just to have members joining. People are staying away from traditional religion in droves. Some denominations have lost 50% of their membership in the last decade or two. It is a testament to what you all have built here, especially those of you who have been around for a while, that this congregation continues to grow. If Channing and Brownson had complaints about their time, I wonder what they would say about ours. Every time I pump gas, depending on where I am, I'm asked if I'm a member of Safeway Rewards Club (laughs) or the Fry's Rewards Club. I was a Costco member until a giant box of oatmeal I bought lasted two years. (laughs) It's true. I sent a donation to the NAACP, so I'm a member of the NAACP. I'm a member of Facebook groups and on and on and on. If the church is just one more of those memberships, then truly, what good is it? In this religious environment, it is a constant lure to yield to consumerism. If we just provide the right programs or put the right people on our Facebook banner, members will surely come flocking. Just wait till we do the right thing, then see what's going to happen. Congregations can resemble department stores or restaurants just trying to get their advertising message lifted above the den for a moment. Many religious Americans have come to see membership in a congregation as something to be shopped for. There's church shopping season now. I'm looking for a congregation with a strong children's program, just the right blend of contemporary and traditional music, and not too much need for my involvement. (laughs) The most potentially deadly part of that path for congregations is the desire to make it effortless to be a member. This is all over the business world. On shopping websites, you just put in your credit card once, and the next time, not only that credit card, but the other credit cards that you've used through history pop up as choices to click on, easy to buy, removing obstacles. And the ads, we want to make home buying easy. I don't know. Maybe it makes sense for them, though, since they're ultimately looking for a transaction with a customer. But hear me, friends. You are not a customer. We're not customers. By joining this free congregation, you covenant with your fellow members to be in deep relationship. To commit your lives to living out our shared values. To stick around when times get tough. To grow spiritually. And to do hard work with one another in the world. And this group of covenant people, by virtue of their dedication and their very presence, we create a holy place in which to mark birth and death. To celebrate finding love and to grieve losing it. Not customers, but people whose lives are shaped by the covenant we enter. Faith is a way of living. It is not a product to be shopped for. And when we join a congregation, we can help shape that shared life of that group of people. Members vote on the budget. Members vote on the minister, a right that was won hundreds of years ago through great struggle by those early ancestors of ours. The right to call your own minister. There is no membership like membership in a congregation. Maybe you think I'm up for most crotchety sermon of the year here. (laughs) But I think the way to increase membership is not to make it easy, 
but to make it meaningful. If you want an easy membership, you can join Costco. If you want true covenant and life-changing, justice-creating results that only come from membership in a congregation, then this is the place. We haven't set this down in any kind of code yet, but I think membership in a Unitarian Universalist congregation ought to require something of us. And so I've worked up what I call the four S's of membership. Four things members of a congregation need to do or be. First, we need to show up regularly, even when the sermon topic isn't your favorite, for at least two reasons. First, it's probably someone else's favorite, and they need you there to support them. Things go better when most of us are here on Sunday. And second, by stepping out of the consumer mindset and showing up, not because the sermon is something you want, but out of commitment to the congregation, you take the risk of learning something you may not even know you need to know. How exciting is that? So show up, the first S. The second is serve. Be on some team or committee in the congregation. And serve the greater cause of love and justice in your community. Drop by the ministry fair today after service and check out the options if you're interested. Talk to me and I can get you pointed in the right direction. But find a place in the congregation to serve one another and the wider world. The third is shape your spirit. Work on your spirituality. We offer lots of opportunities. So does the wider world. You'll find your own and you may end up leading others who follow a similar path to yours. Whatever trail you take, shape your spirit. The Spirit of Life Reading Circle is a good example. That didn't come from me or any of the staff here. It came from members of the congregation who said, hey, what about this? And we said, that sounds great. And it, uh, folks, it's taken off. People love it. And my sense is it'll grow. That happens all the time in congregations. And the fourth, after shape your spirit, is to subsidize the work. Subsidize the work of the congregation by giving at a level of 2 to 5% of your income or more. The life we lead together in our congregations is worth such commitment. It is an old, old way of life. And though our culture makes it difficult, we still catch glimpses of that way of life now and then, even outside the congregation. Puritan leader John Winthrop stood aboard the Mayflower and preached a sermon to his shipmates. He said, we must delight in each other, make others' conditions our own, rejoice together, mourn together, labor and suffer together, always having before our eyes our commission and community in the work, our community as members of the same body. Author Sarah Vowell, who's a very funny writer of American history, writes in reaction to that quote, I'm a reasonably happy-go-lucky person with a serviceable sense of humor and a nice enough apartment in New York, the most exciting city in the world. Once I decided to devote my years of life deciphering the thoughts and feelings of the dreary religious fanatics who founded New England nearly 400 years ago, I was often asked at parties by my fellow New Yorkers the obvious question, what are you working on? When I would tell them a book about Puritans, they would often take a swig of the beer or bourbon in their hands and reply either with a sarcastic fun or a disdainful why. At which point, depending on my mood, I would either mumble something about my fondness for sermons as literature or mention taking my nephew to the Mayflower replica water slide in the hotel pool in Plymouth. I would never answer with the honest truth. Namely, that in the weeks after two planes crashed into two skyscrapers here on the worst day of our lives, I found comfort in the words of Winthrop. When we were mourning together, when we were suffering together, I often thought of what he said and finally understood what he meant. End quote. Winthrop was basically saying to all the people on the Mayflower, 
We've all chosen to be in the same boat. Now, for them, that was literally true. But what a great metaphor for people being freely associated, a congregation being an example. Here, though we don't always get it right, we try to live our lives conscious of our dependence on one another and on all life. You can't shop for that kind of life. You can become a committed participant. So here's what I want to ask you. Be all in. Don't yield to the consumer temptation. Don't try to keep one foot on shore in case the boat doesn't float. I've tried that. When I was younger, I loved bumper boats. You know bumper boats? Oh, the thrill of choking the throttle and ramming into my little brother's boat with such force that mine would stick on top of his until somebody bumped me off. But then at Holiday World in Indiana, my favorite bumper boat venue, the siren would wail and the employee would come on the intercom, all boats, please dock. My palms would begin to sweat. Little beads would break out on my lip and my forehead as I pointed my boat toward a dock because as fun as they were, I could not get off the things. Three times as a teenager, I fell into the bumper boat pool (laughs) trying to make it to shore. My problem, I was told by a host of 13-year-old workers who were trying to help, I don't, they look 13, was that I would get one foot on the dock and one foot on the boat, and then as the boat began to drift away, carrying with it my foot and my self-esteem, I would become paralyzed with fear and splash into the gasoline-filled water doomed to walk the park soaked, smelling of fossil fuel for the rest of the day. As the commercials say, don't be like that me. Be all in. Risk something to make this congregation and our faith greater. And if you need it, we'll be here to give you a helping hand. Amen.